Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The congregation may be seated. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, once again, we are in the Lenten season. This is Ash Wednesday. It is a night as I can look out there and I can see on the foreheads of all those people who at one time in the future will return to dust. And the reason for that is because of the earthly wisdom that we have gained here. Yes, I say earthly wisdom. And the reason I talk about wisdom is that it really is about what our, our gospel lesson is about, is wisdom. And we talk about the wisdom of the kings. And when we think about kings here on this earth, of course, the, the most famous, the most wise king that we know in all of history was that of King Solomon. He was a king. He was the king of Israel. And he had all of the trappings that were there. In fact, when you went into his throne room, there he sat six steps high. And as you approached his, his throne, there were lions on each one of those steps on each side. And then you got to his throne, the place where he sat. It was a throne that was made of ivy, covered in gold. The armrest were beyond imagination, filled with jewels. The back of it had the kingly symbol of force, which was the calf, the head of the calf. His very footstool was made out of solid gold. What a king. And then to end all that, he was one that was blessed by God. In fact, when he was a young boy, when he was just getting ready to take the kingship, God asked him, what is it that you want as a king? And he already showed out of his lips wisdom because he said to the Lord, he says, give me the wisdom to rule your people. And so God blessed him and made him the most wise of all people. In fact, he was so wise that the queen of Sheba came 1,200 miles just to try to test him, just to try to trip him up, just to simply hear his answers to some very difficult questions. But every time he spoke, out of his lips came words of wisdom. He gave us words of nearly 300 proverbs. Yes, th or, I'm sorry, 3,000 proverbs. We just started the first one of them today in Bible class. But yet when we look at him, we see a great king, a great king full of wisdom. But there was a problem. He didn't listen to his own wisdom. What we see in his, in his later years, we see a man that in his, the fifth chapter of Proverbs says that rejoice in the wife of your youth. But yet at the end of his life, he rejoiced in the life of 700 wives. Didn't listen to his own his own wisdom, did he? How anybody could put up with seven, seven hundred wives, I don't know. But it seems that all the wisdom that he had spewed out of his mouth, he didn't listen to. And in his later years, it seemed that the more, the more, the, the more, the older he got, the more he turned away from those true words of wisdom, the words of God, the words that God blessed him through the Holy Spirit of giving him. In fact, he said that chasing gold, he says, beware those of you who chase gold. But at the very end of his life, it seemed that he could do nothing more than gather as much gold as he wanted. And of course, his greatest wisdom was saying this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Very first, very first verse in, 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 the, in the book of, of Proverbs. But yet at the end, it seemed like he feared everything except the Lord. You know, we have a word for that today. We, we sang it in our last song. It's called hypocrite. Because he says one thing and he did another. 
But let's take a look at some other people, or at least some self-proclaimed kings. They go by another word, another title, and it was called the Pharisees. In fact, that's what Jesus was doing when he was talking there on the mount. In fact, that's where we catch up with him in Matthew. He's sitting there on a hillside, and he's t it's, it's a sermon of the mount, and he's telling those people that are, that are gathered around him, and he's preaching and he's teaching to them. And he says, beware, look out for those. You know those people that would go out, and they go out on the street corners and they pray? They make themselves known so that people can look at them and say, hey, look at them, they are, they are righteous people. So that's not what it's about. Look at them. Look at me. I'm a Pharisee. I'm better than the rest. I love everyone. But did they really? Or were, that, were the people that were subject to them just simply pawns in their acquiring of power and wealth? And Jesus tells us, he says, beware of that. He says, when you pray, don't go off and, and make it known, but you pray in secret. When you give, don't let people see. Don't blow your own trumpet. But do it in secret. Because when you're out there and you do it in public, you're receiving your reward. How many times do we see the Pharisees caught up in, in, in the hypocrisy? Saying that they are the chosen one of God. They are the chosen leaders of God's people. Yet turn around and the other thing and, and fall into sin and, and live lives of sin. These are the kings. Where's the wisdom that they had? And I'm sure most of us can sit here and point fingers, can't we? <laughs> well, look at Solomon. Look at what he did. Look at the Pharisees. Ah, I can see them coming a mile away. But what about when we look into our own lives? Are we guilty of being hypocrites as well? Do we say that we are followers of Jesus Christ? Do we bear the name of Christian? But yet run when we say we've got a special service coming up? Or aren't in Sunday school or aren't in church? Sure, we don't go out and pray in the streets, most of us. We don't blow our horns when we do that. But how many times does somebody come to us and, and, and tell us a problem? We say, we'll pray for you. And we completely forget about it. How many times do we say that we're going to love somebody, but yet when we, when we see the stranger on the corner or the person that needs help, we walk right by? You see, the reality of it is, is that for all of us in this world, we are living lives of hypocrites. We say that we're people of God, but yet we do the other things. That's where we have to look to the wisdom of another king. A king that had, that deserves a golden throne, but yet left his golden throne, and we see the throne that he sits upon. In fact, when he gathers his people together, he sits there not on a throne, but he sits there on a grassy hillside. And he calls his people, and he, and he teaches his people the same king that would deserve a golden throne. But yet he willingly accepts the throne that his father gave him. While Solomon's throne was made of gold and ivory and precious jewels and all of those things, his throne was one that was made of wood that was covered in blood. His throne was one that he took upon himself. Wasn't what he deserved, but yet he did that. He did that because he came into this world and he took upon the sins of each one of us. Each one of us that deserves to be dust. 
That's why we put it on our foreheads to remind us that we have come from dust and that's where we, we will return. But yet we see the wisdom of God and we hear those words, those golden words that we, we receive from his lips. And they're golden words to us today. And they're words that we can hold on to. They're words that we can take. They're words of promise. They're words of salvation to us. Because when we hear those words from his lips, your sins are forgiven. You can take that to the bank. You can trust on that. You can rely on that. And he shows us and he proves that to us by giving us his very body and blood. Here in a few moments, we're going to receive that very body and blood that he gives us. And he says, take this. Eat my body. Drink my blood. Take this, for this is a new promise. It is a new testament. It's a new covenant that I make to you. You people of the dust, this is the new one. Because I went to the cross. I'm giving you this so that you know that your sins are forgiven and you know that you have eternal life. And so we hear that true words of wisdom. The words that are very key to heaven. And for us as poor, miserable sinners, for us as hypocrites, for the us that's turned our back on God, for us that doesn't listen to the wisdom, it changes us. It makes us holy. It fortifies us with the Holy Spirit so that when we do hear those words, that we can resist temptation, we can resist sin, and we want to live a new life. Because that new life is one that's rooted in the, in the blood of Jesus Christ. It's one where he, he, he comes into us. And he lives and it's, he's a part of us. Remember that through your baptism. What a blessed day that was. When you had a little bit of water sprinkled on your forehead. That was Christ marking you as his own and saying that this covenant is for you. This promise is for you. It's not only for you, it was for your family and for your, your family to come. What wisdom that's there. The wisdom of Jesus Christ. Those words that come from his mouth. And we know it's true wisdom. Because this was not, does not come from a king that spoke and did the opposite thing. No, what Christ Jesus did is he, he walked the walk and talked the talk. He did what he said he was going to do. When his heavenly father said, go and die for the sins of those who we love. He willingly went and he took upon it. Resisting every temptation that we, we do. He was tempted in every way that we were. In fact, on Sunday, we're going to be talking a little bit about the temptations of Christ. And to know that he suffered from the same pains and the same problems that we did. But yet he resisted sinfulness. He resisted that. And he walked the walk. He didn't live a life of hypocrite. He did what he said he was going to do. And you see, that's our game. That's our profit. That's the treasure for us. It's our treasure. That he died for our sins. To make us holy and righteous. Because the reality of it is, is when we look into our, ourselves... We're no different than King Solomon. We're no different than all the other kings and the Pharisees and all those who'd placed themselves in leadership throughout all history. We're all born of the same cloth. We all have the same DNA. But praise be to God that he went to the cross and he died in order to take that sin away, to break the cycle, to change us, to make us new, to make us a new creation in him. And yes, he walked his walk. For he has one husband of one wife, the church, of which each one of you are a part of. And he loves that church so dearly. 
He loves that church that he was willing to place his grace and his mercy upon it. So even though, even though we've been broken by sin, even though we don't do what we say we're going to do, that he washes us and he makes us new. And he calls us to repent. And that's really what this season is about. Reflecting upon those things that we have done. Reflecting upon our sinful nature. But there's a difference in us. For the unbeliever that's out there in the streets, they reflect and they see it and they're broken. We look at it. For those who believe, for those who are part of the bride of Christ, for those who are a part of the church, we look at it and rejoice. We rejoice because our sins have been cleansed, our sins have been taken away, and God has made us new. And so he calls us to go and collect treasures. Not treasures of this earth, but treasures of heaven. And of course, we all know what that is, don't we? People. The true treasure of God is people. And so he calls us to go in repentance, to lay those sins of the cross, and then tell the world of what Christ has done. Tell everybody of what this king has done for us. Spread the wisdom of, of, of Jesus Christ, the true king, the true king of the Jews, the true king of his church, the true king of all eternity. That's what, Advent, that's what Lent is about. That's what we have. And praise be to God. For all of you with a dirty forehead, that's the promise to you. And now that mark is no longer dust. For on that last day, God will call those out of dust and he will gather you together and he will form his new church. He'll put all of that together and he gives each of you eternal life. So celebrate. That's the joy. But reflect. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the peace that passes all